Did anyone expect the Robespierre Reiches, the uh, the F caps? I'm going to start calling the Robespierre Reiches F caps, economic fascists, formerly known as progressives. Because calling these people progressives, it implies that they are for progress when they are in fact economic fascists, which are which economic fascism is the antithesis of progress. Today, I want to talk about the concept progressive. There's a certain category of Democrat politicians that lie somewhere between socialism and moderate neoliberals who favor free markets. Think about people like um, Elizabeth Warren, Ro Khanna, Robert Reich, goofy ass Gavin Newsom, and many other Democrats, politicians who do not want to go nearly as far as getting rid of capitalism. In fact, even um, Elizabeth Warren uh, describes herself as a capitalist. She says, I'm a capitalist to my to to my bones. You're a liar. And you even have Robert Reich. She wrote a book called Saving Capitalism. So while uh, these g -g -g goons are in favor of more government intervention into the economy and into our lives, while they favor more wealth redistribution, uh, they do not, I don't think they want to go nearly as far as getting rid of capitalism completely. I don't think they want to go nearly as far as getting rid of private property rights, but they definitely favor more wealth redistribution programs and more government intervention into the economy. And I, like uh, others, have labeled this category of Democrats as progressive. Even uh, some of the Wikipedia pages, like this is Elizabeth Warren's Wikipedia page. See the highlights? A member of the Democratic Party and regarded as a progressive. Then we have Gavin Newsom highlighted. Newsom has been uh, labeled, he's been seen as a progressive leader. Ro Khanna. Where's Ro Khanna? Ro Khanna. Khanna identifies as a progressive capitalist, whatever the fuck that means. My problem with using the term progressive is it plays right into their hands because it implies that these wannabe economic planners are in favor of progress. It implies that their policies will bring about progress that they're um that expanding the role of government into our lives is uh is moving forward it's making progress and i don't think it's fair to pay these g -g -g goons such a compliment i think a more accurate term is economic fascist although part of me thinks that economic fascist perpetuates this notion that there's a difference between economic freedom and social freedom. It's been said that progressives want to uh, control your boardroom while conservatives want to control your bedroom. I think this is a false dichotomy. I think a solid concrete of this false dichotomy is uh, the legalization of marijuana, particularly in places like California. It's been reported that uh, California's legal weed industry cannot compete with the illicit market with the black market, local government opposition, high taxes, and competition from unlicensed businesses are complicating the state's push to build a thriving legal market. I covered this back in uh, December um, about how California is now offering hundreds of millions of dollars to rescue the struggling marijuana industry. Oh, you absolutely suck! My buddy, Sean, the actual justice warrior, actually did a whole deep dive on this issue a few weeks ago. I highly recommend checking that out. So you would think, you would think that uh, legalizing marijuana in California, it would be a huge win for social freedom, which in a way it is. People are not getting arrested anymore. They're not going to have to deal with penalties like spending time in a cage or paying government fines for having shards of a plant in their pocket or having a joint or a blunt or some form of paraphernalia in their trunk. That's good. But a lot of businesses, because of regulations, environmental regulations, fees, taxes, licensing, 
um, it's having a uh, negative impact on the industry to the point where there is still a thriving black market in cannabis in the state of California, in which case you got to ask, what good is the social freedom to consume cannabis when commercializing it has been insanely costly to the point where people are still buying and selling marijuana illegally? So there's really no difference between economic freedom and social freedom, although in all fairness, you could say that today's progressives are much more focused on controlling your boardroom than they are controlling your bedroom. A little different from the progressives during the progressive era of the 20th century that we learn about in grade school, the heroes of the progressive era, the muckrakers, the progressives who uh, led, the, led the way on alcohol prohibition and flirted with, uh, flirted with eugenics. Oh, uh, you absolutely suck! Either way, we're taking baby steps with our concepts. That was a century ago. We're taking baby steps. Let's let's first focus on stopping calling the uh, Elizabeth Warrens, the Gavin Newsoms, the Ro Khanna's. Let's stop calling them progressive, which is too high of a compliment. Too high of a compliment for these monumental buttholes. Let's start calling them economic fascists or FNAPs, economic fascists, formerly known as progressives. In my last video, I called them FCAPs and someone pointed out that that might be confusing because CAP is often associated as an abbreviation for capitalist. So I'm open to changing it to FNAPs, FNAPs, FCAPs. What do you guys think? Let me know in the comments down below. Now, some people may argue that uh, we, you know, we shouldn't call the left fascists because fascism is more associated with the right wing, particularly those who call themselves nationalists. Like, like, uh, like Donald Trump. You guys remember when Donald Trump embraced the term nationalism? He said, yeah, I'm a nationalist. And people lost their shit. Left wing pages like uh, Occupy Democrats were sharing memes like this. Here's another meme. Trump saying, I'm a nationalist and I'm proud of it. And then them saying nationalism is the opposite of patriotism. To confuse nationalism with patriotism is to mistake contempt for love and fear for valor, blah, blah, blah. Most notably, it's these memes. This one is from Other 98% saying early warning signs of fascism, powerful, one of those being powerful and continuing nationalism. Finally, we got this meme. Um, Adolf Hitler said, I'm a nationalist. Trump said, I'm a nationalist. Wake the heck up, America. This is no longer a circus or a bad reality show. This is a full-on fascist takeover of our country. So there are a lot of people that like to equate fascism with nationalism, and you could say somewhat rightfully so. Fascism is associated with the right wing. So if I were to uh, read a few quotes like these, here are a few quotes. I do not ask for over-centralization, but I do ask that we work in a spirit of broad and far-reaching nationalism. When we work for what concerns our people as a whole, we are all Americans. The American people are right in demanding that new nationalism, without which we cannot hope to deal with new problems. The new nationalism puts the national need before sectional or personal advantage. This new nationalism regards the executive power as the steward of the public welfare. It demands of the judiciary that it shall be interested primarily in the human welfare rather than in property, just as it demands that the representative body shall represent all the people rather than just any one class or section of people. Also saying these methods have put a premium on selfishness and naturally the selfish Big interests have gotten more than their smaller, though equally selfish brothers. The duty of Congress is to provide a method by which the interest of the whole people shall be all that receives consideration. 
To this end, there must be an expert tariff commission who wholly removed from the possibility of political pressure or of improper business influence. This, I know, implies a policy of a far more active government interference with social and economic conditions in this country we have yet had, but I think we have got to face the fact that such an increase in government control is now necessary. One may hear this stuff and think, yeah, that's definitely an Adolf Hitler or a Benito Mussolini or a Donald Trump. When in fact, it was uh, former president Teddy Roosevelt, who despite being a Republican and avowed nationalist, that was from his essay, The New Nationalism, uh, he's also often uh, uh, associated with, Teddy Roosevelt, he is often associated with, the progressive era. He's often associated with the progressive era in United States history and often admired by left-wing pages like Occupy Democrats. They love making memes and quotes of uh, their hero, Teddy Roosevelt, including Ro Khanna. This is a meme that Ro Khanna made that uh, Ro Khanna himself saying Roosevelt was a Republican and he even, even he got it. Roosevelt, he's associated with the progressive era with his populism and his expanding government influence over the economy, as I just mentioned, with new regulations and trust busting. Bringing it back to today, was Teddy Roosevelt much different than, say, an Elizabeth Warren? Teddy Roosevelt was one of the loudest advocates for a new form of taxation at his time, the income tax, which was specifically geared towards raising taxes on the rich and the wealthy. Roosevelt also constantly demonized big, greedy businesses, hence his hard-on for trust-busting. Meanwhile, Elizabeth Warren today, she's pushing for new taxes. She's pushing for a wealth tax, which is specifically geared towards raising taxes on the super mega ultra wealthy. When Teddy Roosevelt ran for president in 1912, he ran on a platform, on a campaign of what he called the new nationalism. Elizabeth Warren, uh, when she ran for president in 2020, she ran on a program that she called economic patriotism. Teddy Roosevelt, again, was known for trust busting Elizabeth Warren. She's constantly talking about how we have to break up what she considers tech monopolies or monopolies in general. Now, lately, she's been going after oil monopolies and meat packing monopolies. Now, one may say that Teddy Roosevelt, despite being a self-proclaimed nationalist, he predated fascism. A progressive might say, forget the fact that a lot of people are trying to conflate nationalism with fascism now. You know, nationalism, it might have meant something different to Teddy Roosevelt. He was a progressive. Maybe what I should do is try to uh, compare progressives with self-proclaimed fascists. So let's go straight to the source of fascism, Benito Mussolini. Let's hear him. Let's hear Benito Mussolini describe fascism. This is from uh, Benito Mussolini. He says, a lot of nonsense has been talked about with the inalienable rights of the individual and a great deal that was mere vague sentiment and pleasing speculation has been put forward as a fundamental principle. He also said, we used to say that the ideal of government was for every man to be left alone and not interfered with, except when he interfered with somebody else and that the best government was the government that did as little governing as possible. That was the idea obtained in the 18th century. But we are coming now to realize that life is so complicated that we are not dealing with the old conditions and that the law has to step in and create new conditions under which we may live, the conditions which will make it tolerable for us to live. The trouble with the theory is that government is not a machine, but a living thing. It falls not under the theory of the universe, but under the theory of organic life. It is accountable to Darwin, not to Newton. It is modified by its environment, necessitated by its tasks, 
shaped to its functions by the sheer pressure of life. No living thing can have its organs offset against each other as with checks and balances and live. On the contrary, its life is dependent upon their quick cooperation, their ready response to the commands of instinct or intelligence, their amicable community of purpose. Living political constitutions must be Darwinian in structure and in practice. Society is a living organism and must obey the laws of life, not of mechanics. It must develop. All the fascists ask or desire is permission in an area when development, evolution is the scientific word, to interpret the law according to the Darwinian principle. All they ask is recognition of the fact that a nation is a living thing and not a machine. So that was, that was, been, oh, wait a minute. I'm sorry, guys. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That actually was not Benito Mussolini. That was, uh, that was actually uh, Woodrow Wilson describing what he thinks is progress. This is from uh, Woodrow Wilson's book, The New Freedom, A Call for the Emancipation of the Generous Energies of the People. The quote about inalienable rights is a quote I've uh, found in secondhand sources. So uh, uh, apologies for that mistake, you guys. So let's actually read some uh, Bonito Mussolini. This is uh, Benito Mussolini's The Doctrine of Fascism. I guess this was written in 1927, but not published until 1932. But um, let's, let's read some quotes that I highlighted from this essay. Fascism sees in the world not only those superficial material aspects in which man appears as an individual standing by himself, self-centered, subject to natural law, which instinctively urges him toward a life of selfish momentary pleasure, it sees not only the individual, but the nation and the country. Individuals and generations bound together by a moral law with common traditions and a mission which suppressing the instinct for life closed in a brief circle of pleasure builds up a higher life founded on duty, a life free from the limitations of time and space in which the individual, by self-sacrifice, the renunciation of self-interest, by death itself can achieve the purely spiritual existence in which his value as man consists. Going on to say, in the fascist conception of history, man is only by virtue the spiritual process to which he contributes as a member of the family, the social group, the nation, and in function of history to which all nations bring their contribution. Mussolini goes on to say, fascism is therefore opposed to all individualistic abstractions based on 18th century materialism, and it is opposed to all Jacobinistic utopias and innovations. It does not believe in the possibility of happiness on earth as conceived by the economistic literature of the 18th century, and it therefore rejects the theological notion that at some future time, the human family will secure a final sentiment of all its difficulties. Anti-individualistic, the fascist conception of life stresses the importance of the state and accepts the individual only insofar as his interests coincide with those of the state, which stands for the conscience and the universal will of man as a historic entity. It is opposed to the classical liberalism which arose as a rejection to absolutism and exhausted in historical function when the state became the expression and the conscience and will of the people will of the people you guys liberalism denied the state in the name of the individual fascism reasserts finally going on to say right here in the bottom right hand corner a nation as expressed in the state is a living 
ethical entity only so far as it is progressive. So uh, does all of this uh, stuff that uh, Mussolini says, does it sound much different than the stuff we uh, just heard from uh, Woodrow Wilson? I say... fact, taking it a step further and uh, demonizing selfishness and all that stuff, uh, doesn't sound much different than uh, Teddy Roosevelt's stuff from the new nationalism either. Inalienable individual rights, they were a thing for the 18th century. It's time to move on and recognize the nation as a living entity whose uh, individual citizens are merely members of the nation. Sounds pretty, uh... Or maybe it sounds more like... No offense, but it sounds like some fucking commie gobbledygook. So the essence of fascism is the subordination of the interests and rights of the individual to uh, the state or to the nation, rejecting the ideas of liberalism of the 18th century. Add to this the fact that uh, before fascism became a dirty word after being associated with the Nazis... Many progressives in America celebrated and applauded Benito Mussolini's new system of government. Jonah Goldberg talks a lot about this in his book, Liberal Fascism. Jonah Goldberg talks about uh, Mussolini was a particular hero to the muckrakers, those progressive liberal journalists who famously looked out for the little guy. No surprise there. When Ida Tarbell, the famed reporter whose work helped break up the Standard Oil Company, was sent to Italy in 1926 by McCall's to write a series on the fascist nation, the U.S. State Department feared that this pretty red radical would write nothing but violent anti-Mussolini articles. Their fears were misplaced. Tarbell was wooed by the man she called a despot with a dimple, praising his progressive attitude toward labor. Similarly smitten was Lincoln Steffens, another famous muckraker who is today perhaps dimly remembered for being the man who returned from the Soviet Union de declaring, I have been over into the future and it works. Blow it out your ass. Shortly after that declaration, Stephens made another about Mussolini, saying God had formed Mussolini out of the rib of Italy. Goldberg goes on to say, as we'll see, Stephens saw no contradiction between his fondness for fascism and his admiration of the Soviet Union. Even Samuel McClure, the founder of McClure's Magazine, the home of so much famous muckraking, championed fascism after visiting Italy. He hailed it as the great step forward and the new ideal in government since the founding of the American Republic. And if you guys don't believe me that these uh, journalists were progressives, if you go to the Wikipedia page for a progressive era... There's a whole section on muckraking in which it mentions all three of the people that Jonah Goldberg mentions in his book. The journalist who specialized in exposing waste, corruption, and scandal operated at the state and local level, like Ray Standard Baker, George Creel, and Bran Whitlock. Others such as Lincoln Steffens exposed political corruption. Ida Tarbell is the famed in her criticisms of Rockefeller Standard Oil. And as you can see, it features a nice um, picture of McClure's magazine, also mentioned in Jonah Goldberg's book, Liberal Fascism. So before Adolf Hitler and the Nazis came along and gave fascism a bad name, American progressives thought fascism was this wonderful idea. American progressives thought that Benito Mussolini was this wonderful guy. Thankfully, uh, today's progressives gave themselves a nice word to fall back on so that they can move on from uh, now dirty words like fascism and nationalism. And I say, fuck them. I'm done implying that these monumental buttholes are for progress or for moving forward when they insist on using force to shape society 
to their liking, subordinating the rights and interests of the individual to the state or the nation or society or whatever. That is the antithesis of progress. These g -g -g goons they want to seize your wealth. They want to decide how much money you get to make. They want, they want to take over the schools and decide what is taught in the schools. They want to decide which goods and services that you get to purchase off of whatever's left of the free market. They want to decide who you get to trade with and on what which terms. They want to get to decide who you get to hire for your business, who you get to put on your board of directors. They want to decide how you arrange toy aisles in your department stores. They want to decide what kind of car you get to drive. They want to decide whether or not new housing complexes get built in your area. They want to decide uh, where you get to plant crops for stuff like marijuana. They want to decide which material your fucking drinking straw is made out of. And I can go on all day. The point is, using the threat of force to tell people how to conduct themselves in society is not progress. It's fascism.